I'm descended from Adam, but then that's nothing special. We're all descended from Adam. I can trace my line back to Adam. I was the ninth son of the sons of Adam. When I was born, Adam was gone. His son, Seth, had also gone. His grandson, Enosh, was still around. And so were the sons down, down my line. Apart from one, apart from Enoch. Enoch had walked with God 300 years, or 365 years, and then he'd been taken, he'd gone. I never knew my, grandf- my great-grandfather Enoch. But I knew the other generations. They told me the stories. I heard from Enosh the stories he'd heard from his grandfather Adam about the paradise of the Garden of Eden. But our family lived in peace. Nothing special, sons of Adam, but we were just a normal family. My grandfather, Methuselah, taught me how to listen to God. He'd had it from his father, Enoch. Enoch was tuned into God. Enoch walked with God. He knew who God was and he could hear God's voice. Methuselah, my grandfather, Lamech, my father, They taught me how to listen to God, how to tune my ear, to know God's thoughts. But I never expected God to speak to me, not in a voice that I would would hear and know that's God speaking. I knew to listen, and I listened, but it was still a shock when God spoke to me. He said, Noah, you are righteous. You're the only righteous in your generation. And I'm going to end at this generation. I'm going to wash everything away. Washing everything away just doesn't... doesn't it's, it's hard to explain. We had regular floods. We lived near the, the, near the Euphrates River. It flooded regularly. We needed it to flood. That's how you, that's how you did the fields. The fields flooded. That helped the crops to grow. We had floods most seasons. But this wasn't the sort of flood God was talking about. And also, speaking to me, nothing special, just a man, Noah. I didn't expect to accomplish anything great in my life. None of my predecessors had. We'd lived in peace. But God had a task for me. Build a boat, he said. Build a big boat. 135 metres long. 23 metres wide. 14 metres high. That's a big boat. This hall is about 15 metres front to back. So... This hall times nine. This hall is about eight meters across. This hall times three. This hall is about seven meters high. This hall on top of itself. That's how big the boat was. It was a big boat. That took a lot of wood. I had to spend a lot of money on buying a lot of wood. When you start on something like that, it's not a short-term project. It's a big project. It's a big thing. It attracted attention, not just because I was buying all the wood that I could, but because I was building a big boat on land near the river. People started asking questions. I'm a truthful man. I told them the truth. God spoke to me. He told me that he's going to send a flood. It's going to wipe out everything. Everything on the land will die. And he's told me to build this boat. He's told me that there's no righteous in this generation. That the only people that will be saved will be me and my family. 
We need to change our ways, guys. We need to change our ways. We need to, we need to be different. People just laughed. Vanity project, they said. Noah the builder, they called me. And worse, Noah the idiot. Noah the fool. Nobody could believe that a flood of that size could ever come. It's hard to be called those names. It's hard to live with that. My sons helping me build heard that. My father heard that. My grandfather heard that. It's a hard thing to carry with you. But I knew I regularly listened to God. And God said, you are doing the right thing. Build me that ark. Keep going. Don't stop. I knew I was doing the right thing. Doesn't matter what men say about me. Only matters what God said about me. And God said I was doing the right thing. He called me righteous in my generation. He promised that he would save me, my family, my sons, their wives, and the animals. I did as God said. My father Lamech died five years before the flood came. My grandfather Methuselah died the year of the flood. Then I got the warning from God. The animals are coming. Load the ark. Get on the ark. The rain is about to fall. The animals came from all corners in pairs, male and female. And they just came onto the ark. There was no jostling, no fighting, no, no nipping at heels. Even the snakes behaved. We've always had a thing about snakes, my family. You might know that story. But they loaded onto the ark. God said, put enough food on the ark. Make sure you've got provisions. You're going to be on it a while. We built it as best we could. We painted it with pitch inside and out. That's black and smelly. Kind of helps with the smell of the animals. You're cooped up with animals in a confined space. It gets a bit smelly. But the pitch kind of helped for a bit until that wore off. And then the rains fell. And the rains came down and the floods came up, as they say. 40 days, 40 nights of rain, continuous. You think you've had it bad in June. 40 days, 40 nights, never stopped. And the ark floated free. And we floated. And the door was sealed. There was nowhere to go. Exercising was interesting. Have you ever tried exercising an elephant? It's not easy. Then the rain stopped. 40 days, 40 nights, and the rain stopped. And we floated, cooped up in the ark, doors and windows sealed. Tempers can get a bit afraid, but it was a peaceful journey. God's spirit was there. He was with me. I went daily to him. I spoke to him. I listened. He remembered me. He remembered my family. He remembered the animals. And the flood water started to go down. 120 days. And then bump. We bumped into dry land, kind of, fairly wet land. But it was top of a mountain. 
wasn't anywhere to get off really. So I released a raven. Ravens aren't very useful birds. He flew off and never came back. Wings of the storm, they call the raven. He flew away. He circled. I waited. I released a dove. The dove circled and returned. Nothing to land on yet. I released the dove a second time. The dove returned, this time had a leaf in its beak. Olive leaf. There were plants again. The waters had re receded. They'd gone down enough that there were plants. I waited and I released the dove again. The dove didn't come back that time. Still, God had, did not say, open the ark. So I didn't. We waited. It wasn't until day 375, we were on the ark for a year and 10 days before God opened the ark. Then he made a new promise, the same promise he'd made to Father Adam. Be fruitful, multiply in number. He'd saved me, he'd saved my family, he'd saved the animals. That's the business of God. God doesn't change, he's in the saving business. He's been at it since the beginning of time. God saved me, he saved my family, and he made a promise. He wouldn't flood the earth again, not in that way, not to destroy it. That promise still stands, and that saving still stands. God is the same today as he was then. He saved me, he's in the saving business. It's a powerful story, isn't it? Thank you, Rich, for telling it so vividly to us. You know, every story in the scriptures points to Jesus in some way. Um, those of you who've been raised on the Jesus Storybook Bible will know that's a fantastic um, sort of run through the Bible showing how so many of these different stories that are, are in many ways very familiar to us all point forward to Christ. And the story of Noah is no different. In fact, actually, it's a particularly strong one to point to Christ. And I want to just take some time this morning just to talk about how the themes of, of justice and mercy come through this story and how they point to Christ. And we get opportunities in our daily lives to talk about our stories and how they point to Christ and to talk about shared histories and how they point to Christ. And so I just want to take this opportunity to give you one way in which we can look at the story of Noah and point on from that to Jesus. Hopefully this will be helpful to you when you're talking to others about Christ as well. I've called this Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment, and we'll get there in a bit. But I want to start actually just um, with our road in Horsepath. You know, we moved into Horsepath, what, three-ish years ago now. It's a really, really lovely place. It's Actually, it's really quiet, even compared to Wheatley, um, there's like zero crime. It's incredible. We, we've come from city centre Oxford where you have to lock everything everywhere. And I, I probably shouldn't say this, it's going on YouTube, but our bikes haven't been locked up outside our house for like three years now. Um, they've just been sitting in the front garden and they're fine there. In fact, there's almost no reported thefts at all. I think somebody once had a quad bike stolen. And that's, that's about it. And yet just... This last month, um, there's a guy up the road who's been doing some building work on his house, and somebody came along and nicked a bunch of materials off his building site. And it was just 
it was really gutting. You know, we know the guy and we, he'd been offering some stuff for free, you know, leftovers from his building project. There'd been chat about it on all the, um, you know, the, the Facebook groups and the WhatsApp groups and so on. Um, he'd got some people to help him when the rains came unexpectedly and he needed to get top on the roof very quickly. And it, it's a community feel. And suddenly we all felt like, no, that, that, that can't happen. It's not right. And he went to the police and the police said, well, look, you've got CCTV of the guy sort of standing around outside and you've got CCTV of him elsewhere in the village, but you've not actually got footage of him coming on site. So I'm afraid we can't pursue it. And when we heard that, we were really gutted. Um, the same guy had actually, he'd, he'd come to pick up some stuff from our house legitimately. And then obviously just nicked some stuff on the way back. And so we felt a bit culpable as well. It was, we felt gutted and we said, we want justice here. We want, we want something to be done about this. And you know, I sympathize with the police, it's not their fault, but we wanted something to be done about it. And you'll have your own stories of that, stories where you hear something and you think, oh, but I want something to be done about it. It can even be things that go on at school where somebody says or does something unfair and the wrong person gets the rap for it and you go, oh, that's not right. I want something to be different. I want something to change. And the thing is that we all have this innate sense of justice, don't we? we want justice to be done and yet it also gets a bit uncomfortable at times doesn't it because sometimes the justice points the finger at us um i could ask how many people here have got a speeding ticket <laughs> maybe i won't do that but the point stands doesn't it um you can you know you can be going along driving along in the car telling off the kids for something they're doing wrong and then the policeman pulls you over because you've been speeding and suddenly you're like hang on a second i'm on the hook for this and actually, probably most of us drive, I think I'm being fair here, most of us drive as though the speed limit is like one mile an hour faster than we like to go. And the person who zooms by us, you know, in the, in the inner lane, they're going too fast, but it's okay to go 72 in a 70 zone, isn't it? It's fine. You know, there's, there's always a limit just above what we're comfortable with, which is wrong, but we're okay up to there. The same's true, I don't know, like ethical shopping. Okay, you, could, you can go out there and you can buy fair trade tea and coffee. Um, but then you talk to somebody who's worked in the, in the clothing business and you hear about some of what goes on in the supply chain and you think everything that I buy has a human cost and actually I'm complicit in my choices by what I buy. But the thing is that there's just so many of those things. You know, we're all going to end up making consumer choices which ultimately fund injustice somehow. And that's a really awkward position to be in because we want justice but we just don't really want the, ping, the finger to point to us. We don't really want it to affect us. But then that's not justice, is it? If, if we really want the world to be fair, except where it points the finger at us, except where we're the one on the hook, that's not actually fair, that's unjust. Now, there are countries in the world where everybody is watched the whole time. You'll have heard some of them. There are countries where there are no democratic rights. I mean, on the, the World Democratic Index, the worst ones are Chad and Syria and North Korea. And you may have heard some stories coming out of those places. Um, the most surveilled place in Europe is actually Croydon, if you'd believe it. Um, more CCTV cameras per square meter than anywhere else in Europe. But there are places where people are watched the whole time and have no freedom. And the, the, the hammer of justice comes down very hard as soon as you step out of line. And those places are incredibly oppressive. Those places are horrible places to live. Can you imagine every single move of yours being watched in case you stepped out of line and did something wrong? It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? So we need an answer. We need an answer to our desire for justice and yet our desire not to be on the hook the whole time for every little thing we do. And we don't have an answer for that. And Noah didn't have an answer for that. And nor did Lamech, nor did Methuselah, nor did Enosh, all the way back up that line that Rich was telling us about. There is no human answer to the desire for justice and yet the desire for us not all to end up on the hook for everything. But God has an answer, doesn't he? God always has an answer. Noah didn't get everything right. It wasn't Noah who fixed things. In fact, one of the first things we read about Noah after he gets off the ark is he goes and gets drunk and ends up shaming himself in front of his kids. It's not a great story. He's not this incredible hero um, that perhaps we might make him out to be. He's got his flaws like the rest of us. But he did try to please God and he listened to God and he talked with God and he trusted God 
And that trust was what mattered, wasn't it? Because when God said, I'm going to rescue you from a flood, but you've got to build a boat. And how many years did he have to go on building for with no sign of cataclysmic rain? And how long would it take to build a boat that size, even with modern tools? It'd be incredible. It'd be years in the making. He had to do it all by hand with just a team of probably five or six of them or something. He's got to trust God all that time. He did. He had a trust in God. And so when judgment came, when justice came, God gave him a way to escape. That isn't unfair. That's something different, and it's called mercy. You see, God is incredibly just. God is perfectly just. But God is also merciful. And Jesus came to offer that to all of us. He didn't come with a way to ignore the wrong stuff in our lives. He came to give us mercy. He came to give us forgiveness. Probably lots of us have heard the famous words, John 3.16. We could probably do a kind of read it out loud, couldn't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Brilliant. Does anyone know the verse that comes after it? Yes. Preach it, Rachel. For Jesus did not come, or God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I feel like it's one of the missed opportunities of the Christian faith that we learn John 3.16 without 17, because people don't get 3.16 on its own. But 17 sums it up so beautifully. God could have come to condemn. God could have come to judge. And yet he came to rescue instead. This is the Christian message. We're all guilty. We all need rescuing just like Noah, but God comes to rescue, and all we need is to put our trust in him. The New Testament actually makes a connection between being baptized and the story of Noah. It talks about the waters of baptism that you pass through from your old life into the new life in Christ as being like that flood water that Noah passed through with his family. This is the hope that we have that Jesus Christ can bring us through judgment because of his mercy and forgiveness. I wonder what opportunities you'll have to talk to people about that. I wonder what opportunities you have to share your story and say, not because of what I've done and not because we want to ignore wrongdoing, but because God is good and merciful and forgiving. That's why I believe in Christ. That's why I follow him with my life. And it's a compelling message to explain to others as well be really good to take some time yourselves over the, the coming weeks, particularly as we think as well to the summer and all the opportunities we're having during Encounter to talk with people about Christ, to think about how your stories and stories that other people will be familiar with, like Noah's Ark, can point to Christ and how you can quickly make that connection for people. It's a real help. Right now, though, I want to remind us with what Rich started off with, Noah's story started off with listening to God. He was listening. And so when God said, build an ark, he was ready. And he was listening.